thank you again for joining and thank you for participating in our Apiculture Online Hive Chat with NC State. Um, we've had a lot of terrific feedback and participation so far, and so we just want to uh, continue to do this. Uh, while we're in a uh, social distancing phase, but as well as just continuing it, if this is something that people are interested in, in doing semi-regularly. So we're doing this every other week. Uh, so those of you that are interested or would like to share this with anybody else, um, the next one that we're going to be doing is May 20th and keep posted on our webinars webpage for updates and links if you want to uh, be a regular participant. You can also sign up for our Wolfpack Waggle listserv, email listserv, where we will announce and send out those links as well. So just let us know and uh, thanks again for your participation. Now the structure of these webinars, we, we have broken these down into, into four different segments. And so each time here, we're starting out with the segment of bees in season. And so we're gonna be talking about what your bees are doing right now and what you should be doing or at least thinking about doing as a beekeeper at this time of year. And so um, this time of year, of course, is springtime. And because we had such an early spring, uh, the nectar flow is actually trailing off fairly early in, in a lot of places, not all places, because of course it varies quite a bit. Um, and so things started early and, and therefore they're ending a little bit early. Um, one other thing to, to think about is that because they started, the colony started brooding up early, so the mites started reproducing early as well. So if you haven't been um, monitoring for your Varroa mites, be sure to do so um, as soon as you possibly can, just to make sure that they're not um, already getting out of hand, because by the end of the, end of the year, the bees will be in a lot of trouble. Um, looking ahead and thinking, one of the, the primary things as beekeepers is to be projecting ahead one or two brood cycles from now or three to six weeks from now. Um, so because of the early end of spring, uh, be prepared for an end to the uh, early end of the honey season as well to the main nectar flow, which means right now you probably should be cleaning your, your honey extractor and getting all of that ready. Um, another thing to start thinking about is that if you have multiple apiary sites and your spring site is a very good uh, location for a nectar flow, but it's not a very good site in the heat of the summer because it's in you know really full sun and, and not any nearby water, consider moving your hives to a better summer yard um, if the spring yard also isn't a very good summer yard. So just something to think about. Uh, but before I turn it over to Jennifer, we wanted to talk to you about something that she's seeing a lot and that we, we're hearing a lot from beekeepers across the state, and that is dealing with queens and potential queen problems. And so I'm just going to very briefly remind you about the, the queen life cycle uh, before I hand it over to her to talk about um, kind of the practical implications of what you might be seeing in your hives because of it. So as we know, for you know, the summer and the autumn and the winter, the queen is mated and just an egg-laying machine. And, and so what she goes through is, is fairly boring. But at this time of year in the spring, often associated with swarming or, or other colony reproduction, the colonies will raise one to two dozen daughter queens. And those daughter queens then fight to the death in this competition until only one reclaims the nest. When she does that, um, she then goes on orientation flights so she doesn't get lost, and then mating flights where she flies and mates with one to two dozen drones from other colonies, stores the sperm from those drones, and then starts laying eggs. And once she starts laying eggs again, she'll never um, leave the nest again, and uh, she won't ever mate again. Um, so this brief period of time, during this period of time, this kind of queen succession from an old queen to a new queen um, takes some time. And so by using um, this, uh, this timeline that I got from bespoke.info, um, you can see that over successive weeks, it takes a good six weeks for the succession of the old queen to the new queen. 
And so what you can see inside the colonies, after the old queen leaves, nobody is there to lay any more eggs. So you see open brood for about a week, but then it disappears, right? You see the sealed brood, but that hatches out after three weeks. And so once that hatches out, but the queens are still in this kind of mating phase during this time. And so there are times when you don't see any brood, but there's a queen in there because she's a virgin queen but you don't see any brood, so if you're only going by what you see in the brood, um, you might think that they've gone queenless, but they're only in the process of requeening, right? So I'm gonna turn it over to Jen to actually show you some pictures of what this looks like. All right, so hi everyone. What I wanted to discuss tonight is uh, something that I see in my yard, and I, I, I read some of the listservs, so I know everybody else is going through this as well where I see people panicking because they're, they think their hives are queenless. But um, we had an excellent year for swarms. If your bee yard was anything like mine, I was catching them left and right all day. And so now when I'm inspecting my hives, lots of times I go in there and I look and I think maybe this hive is queenless because I don't see a queen and I don't see eggs. So, um, then you have to go do a little bit more detective work to figure out, do I really have a problem? Do I need to get a new queen? Or is this just that instance where it's between queens? And so there's some things that I look for. And so I thought I would share uh, some of these little signals to look for with you. So then maybe you can hopefully figure out if your hive is indeed queen right and you just need to give it more time or if you have to go buy a queen. So first thing, the most obvious one is a capped queen cell or yeah, capped queen cells. If you see capped queen cells in your hive, you can't find the queen, you can't find eggs, but you see a capped queen cell, that hive is technically still queen right. They are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're making a new queen and you just have to wait for that queen to emerge and mate and you just saw the timeline. It'll be a while before you're actually seeing eggs but this is not a queenless hive at this point. So the picture down in the corner, that's pretty extreme. You see that it's pretty obvious. Sometimes you might only find one or two swarm cells down on the bottom of the frame like this. You usually will find a good, at least a handful, if not 10, 15. All right, so then maybe you weren't lucky enough to find that queen cell at that point. You waited a little bit too long or it's just a little bit further along in the process, but you go into your hive, you don't find a queen, you don't find eggs, but you see these tiny little cells with the opening on the bottom chewed perfectly around. That is the evidence where a queen has emerged successfully from that cell. Now the ones over to the right, those were unsuccessful, but if you see anything where it looks like a queen has emerged, then that is uh, just clear evidence that at some point you had a virgin queen in that hive. Doesn't mean she's still there, but it also indicates that there is a good chance there's a virgin queen running around in there. And if you were to go purchase a queen, put her in there in a cage, those bees would not accept her. So you would just be uh, throwing away that queen anyway. So it's worth your while to wait and see if there is a virgin queen and you should, from that point, you need a minimum of 10 days before she would begin to lay eggs. And that's like best case scenario. So it's probably gonna be longer than that. All right, I think next one. Now, if you don't see any queen cells, uh, after that queen emerges, the workers will often chew those cells down so that there are no longer any evidence that there was a virgin queen emerging from a cell. So you might be able to go through your whole hive and not find any cap cells or any emerged cells. But another good signal to look for is if you go into the center of your brood box, the lower brood box, and you pull out the middle frame and they are leaving a nice big open space like that that you see in the center that's a huge frame and they're they've got honey around the edge they're leaving the center of it open and that's an indication that there is a queen in that colony this, those workers have cleaned that out 
and they are preparing it for the queen to go back and fill it in with eggs once she is able to start laying. Once she's mated and laying eggs, that's where she should put them. Now, if you found every frame where there should be brood completely filled up with honey, where they, the brood has um, emerged and then they're what we call backfilling with honey, that is a different story where maybe there is no queen and so they're, they're not saving her any space. So if I see a nice open space like that, I'm pretty sure there's a queen in here. Okay, next slide. So a uh, couple other things to look for. If you, uh, I, I, read, I read the listservs sometimes, never really participate, but I often read them. And I, if I see somebody say that they have cat brood, but no eggs, then that's not even enough time really has passed yet to worry. So if you still see cat brood, uh, you just give it a little bit more time. Another indication is the sound of your bees. When you open up your hive, it should be nice and quiet. And I think after you've been in the bees a few times, you know what they should sound like. But if you open it up and it's really loud and buzzy and the bees are running around, uh, that's a good indication that's queenless. Not always true, because sometimes they act like that. Uh, and then I've also heard people say that if you see bees bringing in pollen, that that is a clear indication that the hive is queen right, which I don't agree with at all. Uh, you can find uh, packed pollen frames uh, even without a queen in there. So don't use that as your only means. All right, and then what can you do? Either way, if, you know, first of all, just be patient. It always takes longer for the queens to get mated and lay eggs than we think it should. We're, we're always in a rush and they know what they're doing. But if you have any doubt and you think your hive is queenless, uh, if you put in a frame of eggs and larvae from another hive and throw it in there, it'll, it'll do two things. It will uh, give you some more time just in case it is queenless so that they won't become laying workers, which is what we're trying to avoid. But also, if they do start to make queen cells, you will then know that it's queenless. And you're also just boosting the population while they're in this uh, requeening mode. So I just you know, encourage everybody to take a little bit more time and patience and look for your queens. Look for signals that you have a queen, even if you can't find her. All right, is that, is that covered? Yeah. No, that's great. Um, Sharon, is there a, a quick question that Jen could answer here pertaining to potential queen problems this time of year? Not immediately, I mean, not directly related to what she's talking about. There's something about mites and um, the installation of um, new packages, but not not exactly, no. Okay. Not right. Well, um, I, I- Listen for queen piping. I just saw that pop up. That is a- Oh. Yeah. That's why don't you explain what that, why don't you explain what is Jen um, and uh, how that's a telltale sign. Queen piping is, especially when there are queen cells, you, you can hear a queen piping. When there's one queen that is out walking around, she will make this piping sound and um, kind of just looking to see if there are other queens out there. And it's, even if you don't know what it is, you'll recognize it as a weird sound. What's that? And um, if it's on the frame that you're actually holding, you can pretty much pinpoint where it's coming from. And, and you're then, not going to do it, are you? You're not going to do it. I'll do oh, it. Oh, no, okay. I'm not going to. Here we go. I'll you, do it. You go it right sounds, ahead. It sounds like this. It has a rising note in the beginning and then pulses. So it sounds like this. Sounds <laughs> Is that good? Much better than I would have Pretty done. good, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, the way that queens communicate with each other so they know how many sisters they have to duke it out with. That's pretty much what, what that is. So, anyway, great, great question. So great, thank you, Jen. And then you know, stay stay live here because I'm going to ask you to to help out in the second segment here, and we'll stay on the same theme of dealing with queens. So what Jen just went through are some, shall we say, natural requeening episodes where you can think that you have a problem or uh, they do it without your intent. But one of the more powerful um, management techniques that you have at your disposal as a beekeeper 
is to actually raise queens on purpose and to be proactive about it. So if your colonies do swarm or if your colonies need to be split to prevent swarming or you catch a new swarm and you want to requeen that other that queen that you caught in the swarm because you don't know, you know, where they came from, having queens on hand at the right time is absolutely invaluable. And so uh, one thing that we do a lot here in uh, our research is uh, to, to test queens and therefore we're raising lots of queens. And our uh, contention is that you can be a beekeeper pretty much at any level and be able to raise your own queens on purpose. With just a little know-how about the biology of the bees and a little know-how about the, the management practices that, that you need to evoke, um, you can raise um, dozens if not hundreds of queens if you do it right. So we'll start with the more basic uh, ways to raise queens. Um, and for those of you kind of in more at the beginning stage in your beekeeping uh, careers, and that is to, in essence, induce that emergency queen rearing or to induce the bees to want to raise the queens on their own, not unlike what Jen was just talking about. And the simplest way to do that is to just go into a, a colony, find the queen, and remove her from that colony. What will happen is that the workers, within about half an hour to an hour, will notice the absence of her queen pheromone, which is normally inhibits them from raising their own queen. That inhibition now gone, the workers are now primed to raise new queens. And the way that they do that in the queen's absence is that they rearrange the, the wax around worker cells and then start feeding that worker larva royal jelly and then that'll become a perfectly good queen. So you can induce queen rearing pretty much at any time by just simply taking a queen out of the colony. Now the problem with that is that you don't have really control over the number that they do, where they do it, um, and, and, and even when, because uh, it might take a, um, a couple days for them to raise a sufficient number of queens. So um, you're kind of empowering the bees to do it and you're, you're seeding your own control over that. Now, uh, another way to kind of do that is to do what, what is known as a walkaway split, which again is, is a pretty standard way of preventing swarming, where you just take one strong colony that's, say, in two brood boxes, and you just split those two boxes in half. One of them gets the original queen. The other half, therefore, has to be queenless. And then you let that queenless half, that queenless split, go through this emergency queen rearing uh, you just walk away and just let nature take its course. So that's another way that you can raise your own queens, and they'll end up with one queen within that queenless colony. Another thing that you can do is you can intentionally dequeen or split a colony and have them raise their own cells, but you do it proactively. You do it, you know, three, four weeks before the rest of your colonies are about to swarm <laughs> or when you might need queens. And then at that point, you can take ripe queen cells and put them, or put a frame with a ripe queen cell into a queenless colony, a queenless split, and therefore they will requeen more quickly than they would otherwise, because you've now jump started and you've gotten ahead where uh, 16 days where um, the development phase of the queen is, is already been done because you started ahead of time, right? Uh, and then one last thing that you can do is if you have one colony that is about to swarm and they have swarm cells and cap uh, swarm cells, you can actually take a razor blade or a very sharp knife and excise those cells from here and then carefully place those and push them into the brood comb of a queenless colony and achieve the same thing. So um, you can play around with these things um, when you, even if you only have one or two hives and you don't have a lot of other uh, fancy equipment to, to raise a larger scale number of, of colonies. There's another thing that you can really coordinate among your mentor, mentees, and others within your club that everybody, you know, this time of year, there's a real shortage of queens and everybody's looking for a, a fully mated queen, but Queen cells can also be exchanged and introduced as long as you're very careful with them. Uh, so consider, you know, if, if you don't have any queen cells, think, or if you have a surplus of queen cells, 
make them available to some of your other club members because there might be some other needy uh, neighbors out there. Now at the intermediate level, um, beekeepers have for a long time, since uh, this guy named Doolittle has developed this very standard method called grafting where uh, beekeepers can intentionally raise uh, dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of queen cells um, at, at a given time. And the way that that works is this kind of sped up video uh, shows you over here, is that you take a frame of young worker larvae out from a colony that you want to make daughter queens from, and you have these uh, plastic or wax cell cups that are on these bars, and you take this metal grafting tool right here, it's just simply a, a, a needle, and there's different types of them, and you uh, very carefully look and reach into a worker cell with a larva, and you pull the, the smallest possible worker larva out of that cell, and then place them into these queen cups. You then place those queen uh, grafted larvae into a uh, queenless cell builder colony like this one. Usually you'd want it to be bigger than five frame nuke, but we were doing this for demonstration purposes. And because those larvae are now hanging downwards, the workers will feed those larvae royal jelly rather than worker food, and they'll effectively raise them as queens. And so this is a way that you can graft and successfully raise dozens and dozens of queens. Now, before those queens emerge and want to kind of murder each other, you have to take those cells and put them into individual colonies so that they can emerge and mate. So the timing is really important for um, grafting, but it's a very, very effective and tried and true practice. There, if you um, have difficulty seeing these larvae that are, that are just so small, you can barely see them. They do have these, uh, these graftless systems like the Yenter kit and some of these others where um, you place the queen into this plastic cartridge with a fake comb, and the queens lay eggs into these plastic cells, but behind them they have this false floor where you can um, pull out the plug with the egg um, still attached onto it, and so you can actually move the egg without having to physically touch the egg and larva, and then put them, again, into these vertically downward orientations into a queenless colony and therefore they will raise queens. I should give a shout out to the NCSBA who has this um, series of trainings on queen rearing called the Born and Bed Bread Program where they are instructing uh, beekeepers at all levels to be able to go through this grafting method and the, the requisite materials and knowledge about how to raise your own queens. It really is a, perhaps one of the most powerful things that you can do as a beekeeper. Um, any other things that you want to add, Jen, if you're still there? Oh, okay, well I might want you to talk about the, the cloak board here. I'll talk about the Demery method real quick, but uh, you have a lot more experience with the cloak board shown over here on the right. But these are pretty much the same thing, and this is a very advanced technique um, not so much that um, it's difficult to do or you need a thousand colonies in order to do it, um, but it's, it's really manipulating the hive in a very complex way um, to convince the bees that they're queenless when they're really not. So um, this Demery method, named after a French beekeeper who kind of came up with it, um, came up with this idea of splitting the brood nest so that they are in this quasi state of queenly, uh, queenlessness. So if you have a, a double deep with a, with a honey super up here, let's say, um, you put the queen and you confine her to the bottom story, the bottom brood nest, so that she can't go up. Above that queen excluder, you then put one, two, three, you know, as many honey supers as you can. And then you put the, the, the eggs and young larvae in a brood nest at the very top. And so what happens is that all the nurse bees are attracted to the top to feed the young larvae. All the foragers and the queen and everything is down here, but they're not interacting with each other. So these two populations are not interacting with each other. And therefore, that inhibitory queen pheromone is not really circulating. So those nurse bees on the top brood box 
are now in essence queenless. And you can put in grafted cells or they'll start raising queens in the top box even though the queen is still technically inside the hive. And so 12 days later you can go in and you can pull out those queens and then you can rearrange the, the boxes back to the way that they were before and the colony won't skip a beat. So it's a really, really cool way to be able to raise queens um, even in the presence of a queen. Now the cloak board does the same thing, but it's a, it's a, it's a, different, pe it's a different piece of equipment that has queen excluder built into it as well as this metal sheet that can be slid in and out to allow the two populations to interchange. Jen, can you explain? So the cloak board is very similar to that. It's just a, there's no space in between the two boxes, like with the, there's no super in between. That metal sheet is what separates the two boxes. The queen pheromone does not travel up through the excluder. So what I do is put the queen in the bottom, put the queen excluder piece with the slide, and then you can use the top box, which you also have to manipulate. You want the, you know, the young stuff up there, some up there so that the, it draws the young nurse bees. And then you can put uh, the queen cells up there. And once they have started working those queen cells, you can pull that slide out. So the queen is in the box, it's still a queen right hive, but they will finish working those cells. So it's kind of like a starter and finisher combined together. Yeah, no, very cool. It's very helpful because it doesn't um, set the colony back several weeks uh, in brood rearing, right? So the colony doesn't really skip a beat. That's a very, yeah. very nice way to do it with min minimal um, equipment inputs. Right? Um, Sharon, any, any questions really quickly on, uh, on queen rearing at whatever level? Yeah, there are a couple. Um, uh, Two of them had to do with this question. Uh, this is from Scott. Um, when is it time, when it's time, will the workers move the eggs to a queen cup or do they always just build around the selected egg? It's a great question. Um, there was one report in the 1980s that was pretty convincing that the workers can move eggs. <laughs> but um, I think that that's probably equivalent to like a two headed snake or a very, very rare event the vast, vast majority of the time, they will re-sculpture the, the, the comb and modify the comb rather than move the eggs. So um, it's, uh, it's debatable, I guess, but um, I think that by most experiences and reports, they're just um, using what's there and not moving things around. Yep, good question. Do you want a couple more? Um, just one more, because I want to get to our main event here with the uh, Apiary oh, Inspectors. Um, from Guy, is it better to place grafted cells into a broodless hive? That's a good question. Um, it, it, it depends. The bees will um, still accept your grafts, but if there's lots of alternatives, like other young larvae, Right, so if there's still a lot of young larvae in the queenless hive, then they might not raise as many of yours and instead raise some of their own kind of emergency queen cells, right? So if you are gonna have a queenless colony, you can have brood in it, but it's better to err on the side of having mostly capped brood rather than open um, young, younger brood. And then that way it'll kind of, hedge your bets to them accepting more of your grafted cells rather than their own emergency queen cells. The other advantage of that too is that that, that capped brood will hatch out and then they'll become nurse bees, which then feed your queen larvae. So um, I think if you're gonna make a, uh, a queenless split or a queenless unit to raise queens, you don't have to make it totally broodless, but it helps to, um, to avoid having a, a, an excess amount of open brood or, or larvae. Great, great questions, everybody. Keep them flowing. Sorry, we can't get to them all. But without uh, further ado, um, I'm gonna um, invite our uh, guests of honor here, which are two of our uh, North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Service uh, apiary inspectors, Adolphus Leonard 
who is uh, a longtime apiary inspector on the eastern part of North Carolina, the northeastern part. And then Lewis Cobble, who is on the other end of the state and is in the mountains and in the western part of North Carolina. And they're both here with us. Um, there's Adolphus. Hello, Adolphus. Lewis. There we go. Am I there? there. Yes, you are. There he is. All right. Thank cool. you guys both for joining us. Sorry we can't put you picture in picture. Zoom doesn't allow that, but um, uh, hopefully everybody's on speaker view so that they can see whoever is, is actively speaking. Um, so I want to get one quick thing out of the way and something that's really uh, made gone viral and, and made a lot of uh, waves this week and, and kind of frustratingly so. And that is this awful term of the murder hornet. Uh, and it's something that I know you guys have been getting um, lots of phone calls. I've been getting swamped with pictures and whatnot um, as well. And so can you just update us please about this Asian giant hornet and why none of us should uh, pay any more attention to it? <laughs> well, we've been looking out for it. Uh, I think there were some, um, they found some in Washington uh on the west coast in the fall of last year and they think that they've uh, got them but they're definitely surveying for those on the west coast uh certainly we have some uh big uh hornet type things in north carolina particularly the european hornet which i think gets a lot of uh airplay people oh this is the this is the thing and uh, it's it's not the thing uh but ncda is um doing surveillance, uh, looking out for uh, invasive species, and uh, so far, uh, no problems. But uh, certainly, uh, I don't think there's much to worry about. But if you find something uh, interesting, give us a call. We're happy to pick it up and get it identified and uh, ease your mind. So Adolphus, um, what is your take on if, if it someday does arrive here in North Carolina. Again, it is not here in North Carolina. It probably won't be for a very, very long time, but let's just say that it was. How would you rate that on the concerns that beekeepers have? Because it is predatory of honeybee colonies, so it is a concern, but how much of a, of a concern do you think it would be? Uh -oh. I would, uh, oh, there you I had trouble there. unmuting my mic. I, I'm good now. I would, uh, I wouldn't be too, it's not at the top of my list. Uh, Varroa mites would still be at the top of my list because that's guaranteed to take your bees out. I'd like to uh, preserve the distance between North Carolina and Washington State as a permanent barrier, <laughs> you know, or at least don't come this side of the Rockies. Yeah. But I've been fielding these questions since the National Geographic ran a special about the Japanese hornet killing bee colonies in Japan. So uh, it's just been ramped up here recently. Yeah, it shows the power of the media, right? So, um, but I think it also hopefully will, will dissipate just as quickly as it, um, it came about this week because uh, yeah, it's, it's nothing that we should really be worrying about at this point. So that's good. Well, okay, good. Enough of the, the wasp. We want to talk about bees. Um, why don't uh, each of you, go ahead, Lewis, and, and start with you. Talk about what you're seeing among the beekeepers that you're inspecting. Um, you know, what's different? What's a problem? What's, what's going well in your local beekeeping uh, populations? Yeah, so far, I mean, overall, uh, we've... Uh, as you said earlier, we've built up quick and early, uh, and that's good and bad. We've had these very large colonies early on, and our uh, mites can be getting ahead of us if we're not paying attention. Also, we have these uh, very large populations, and then sometimes the, the nectar will kind of shrink up on us, and we'll have a couple of weeks where uh, those groceries get kind of tight, and that can be a little stressful on the colonies. Uh, so we, we can see a little bit of European uh, flare up there. And uh, a few weeks ago, I think I even had a few uh, colonies in the area starved to death during a little cold wet spell uh, of colonies that weren't provisioned uh, very well. Uh, 
Yeah. And we had a couple of days of cold weather and uh, they kind of just fell out, which is a risk um, sure. in, in um, early spring. And we have, we're headed for a cold spell this weekend. And uh, so I think, you know, it depends on where you are as to whether uh, and, and what kind of beekeeper you are as to whether your uh, bees are, are going to be uh, well suited for this, this little cold snap, but definitely make sure they have uh, uh, plenty of uh, nectar uh, close to that brood nest and you shouldn't have any problems at all. Uh, if they're living hand to mouth, uh, that could be a real problem this weekend. So just make sure they're not living hand to mouth uh, and you should be all right. Um, how, many, it, how many weeks ahead, Adolphus, do you think you are from Lewis because of the uh, elevational difference? Um, kind of you, you on the eastern part of the of the coastal plain. Well, from the uh, for you use starvation as a milestone. Starvation was an issue here about four or five weeks ago. Oh boy, that was a long time ago. But uh, and we there was quite a few colonies, strong colonies that died from, from a cold snap four weeks ago, but uh, now the honey flow is on and there shouldn't be any colony starving unless the beekeeper has done something really unusual. Uh, I will say that checkerboarding has been demonstrated on YouTube and other places by some uh, beekeepers uh, and Sometimes beginners practice an extreme version of that oh, and it right. can really cause trouble. You can take a perfectly viable colony and really mess it up by over distributing the brood uh, in an extreme fashion. And then a cold snap comes along and you have chill brood and they're dumping out dead brood. So you want to avoid uh, silliness. And if you're not sure if it's silly or not, just ask a mentor or an apiary inspector and we'd be happy to show you the difference between silliness and a uh, common sense uh, expansion of the brood nest. So what, what would be the, the maximum number of, so by checkerboarding, what Adolphus is referring to is alternating um, existing brood, but then a frame of, of foundation to decongest the brood nest to prevent swarming. But I would only do at most two or three, even in the strongest of colonies, right? You wouldn't want to um, right. Come, yeah, so I, I would start to. moving a couple from the outside to the end and uh, put a couple of empties in the middle of a good, nice expanding brood nest. Right. But what I have seen on more than, on, well, sadly, many, several occasions is literally every other frame was an empty Ooh, yeah. for the whole brood nest in March. And that's just a no no. Maybe if you lived in South Florida, you could get away with it, but not in March in North Carolina. Right, right, right. So just a couple frames at a time. And then when they fill those up, you can give them some more room. So just a couple at a time. Don't That's get good. carried away. So um, let's take a little larger perspective. And over the last couple of years, um, Lewis, I'll bounce it back to you. What, what are some of the uh, um, disease or other problems that might be on the rise or others that might be waning? Like what's the, the overall uh, sense from your perspective? Yeah, I don't think there's anything too dramatic or new coming on. So there are uh, three things that I see that if we could get these things pretty good, we would not really have that many problems and they're all kind of management type things. So I would say 90 to 95% of the problems that I run into as an inspector, number one is varroa mites by far, and the virus is associated with the mites. And I think the viruses are continuing to get worse. And uh, so our threshold, thresholds for mite numbers continues to go down. There's just no leeway for uh, high mite loads. I mean, you, I think we maybe could get away with it 10 or 15 years ago, uh, but we can't get away with it or much anymore, but definitely, uh, keeping an eye on those mites and viruses. Don't let them get too far out of control. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and when I say too far out of control, I mean like above 5%. <laughs> so you really want to be below 2%, I would say all the time. And that's pretty low. So that takes some work to, to stay there. Uh, so mites, right now, you guys were hitting exactly on the right notes when you're talking about queen events and what to do about those queen events, because that's the thing that's, that's going to be 
biting most people uh, between now and the middle of June. Yeah. So some folks are adding queens when they don't need to. Some folks are not paying attention and they're going to wind up with uh, land workers in the middle of June or early July. That's when the wax moths and the high beetles move in. Yeah. And uh, so you guys are hitting it uh, exactly right and great advice. Uh, people really need to watch out and manage those queen events. That's the biggest thing to handle right now, this time of year. And by Probably that, about, it's not just swarming, it's premature failing of queens or uh, superseding for unknown reasons, right? So it's not just swarming per se, but it's lots of other- Right, I'm just gonna call it a queen event because yeah. sometimes I'll say, I'll examine the colony and they'll say, I'll say, you've had a queen event, or I'll say, you, you had a swarm, and the beekeeper will say, well, I didn't see a swarm. I was like, okay, well, let's just back up. We'll call it a queen event. You've had a queen event. Right, right, <laughs> well, I don't right. know if it was super seizure. I know in my own colonies, I, sometimes I accidentally kill the queen. That's a queen event. They got to do it over, <laughs> right? right? So it happens, yes, right? No it problem. Does. It does. Uh, but queen event can be a super seizure, swarm, accidentally killed the queen, uh, whatever. Okay. But recognizing that you've got a queen event and understanding how to um, uh, deal with it. Sometimes you need to sit on your hands. Sometimes you need to give it time. And all the advice you, gave, you guys gave tonight was spot on. So that was very timely and very good. Great, good to know. About a month ago, the, the, I think uh, the third issue is feeding. We touched on that a little bit that I see, uh, especially new beekeepers, uh, are scared to death of their colonies, um, uh, starving to death, and they will literally feed them to death, right? They'll feed them <laughs> into a queen event. And uh, so right. you have to be careful uh, and be judicious with feeding. Yeah. So I, I think those three things, handle the mites, handle your queen events, handle your feeding. You're gonna have more bees and you know what to do with. You will never ever have to buy bees. And that should be every beekeeper's goal to never ever have to buy bees. Yeah, no, that's great. Adolphus, what, what's your take on that? Would you agree with it or is uh, Lewis full of it? Of course, I would agree with uh, my esteemed colleague from Western <laughs> Carolina. But uh, you know, also I think he would agree that at least down east, we had such a ridiculously early season that uh, it's great for brood rearing. And what's great for brood rearing is great for mite reproduction. Yep. So it's going to be even more challenging to control mites this year than in a normal year because we have extreme brood rearing from very early in the season. Yeah. So watch those numbers, do your sugar shakes and your alcohol washes. And I would say I've seen a lot of uh, posts on the NCSBA Facebook page about everybody catching swarms. There's been a lot of swarms, and that's great. I wish folks would do the mite monitoring on those swarms to see what they're picking up in those swarms, because yep. uh, that would be wins. very interesting. I have seen some swarms would have a lot of mites in them, Correct. and uh, that is a, a broodless colony that's the best time to deal with those mites. It's yeah. very hard to kill mites in a large colony with a lot of cat brood, much easier to deal with them in a smaller colony with not a lot of cat brood. Very, very you, true. You have a very good opportunity to hit the reset button in these colonies without any cat brood. Yeah, that's great. Well, well, thank you guys. You guys are, are real um, kind of local rock stars and, uh, the North Carolina um, community is just ever thankful to, to have all of you. And, and unfortunately, uh, the rest of your colleagues are six full-time apiary inspectors. Um, and so they just do an amazing job all across the state. And so uh, th thank you for all of that. Um, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and, and um, share the screen again and, and get to our, our last and final um, uh, segment here was just an open Q&A. And so Adolphus and Lewis, I wanna uh, continue to uh, um, have you involved in this because I'm sure that you'll be able to answer all these questions uh, far better than I would. I did see one on, on the chat box to kind of segue from what you were just saying, Lewis, and, and what Adolphus had said about monitoring for your mites right now. 
um, how, how soon is too soon or how soon after you make a split do you want to check for mites? Uh, so if you, I like for the queen to be established and laying, you know, so if you're doing a split, uh, I like to, for her to get on her feet and have some open brood. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can uh, do that monitoring before she has too much capped brood, uh, that'll give you a very good idea of what your mite load is. And you have good opportunities to deal with it if it's high. So same thing, if I catch a swarm, uh, I'm going to hive them. I'm going to let that queen get established, make sure she does get established and is laying and they have some skin in the game. And then I can do that monitoring. And if I need to, I can handle the mites. And uh, also if a colony that has had a queen event, they're going to have this um, no cat brood situation coming up. Use that to your advantage. All right. I would agree. Um, okay. <laughs> glad, to, glad to have you. Uh, some agreement there. Um, Sharon, any other um, questions that have been flying in? I, I really appreciate all the questions. Unfortunately, won't be able to get to all of them, but um, Sharon, are there any uh, good questions that you'd like to raise? Um, I thought this was uh, an interesting one from Jeff. What is the quality, compare the quality of swarm cell queens to emergency cell queens. Dolphus, you wanna take that one? Sure. Uh, swarm, swarm cells are generally uh, first rate quality. They're well fed. The reason they're swarming is because the colony's prosperous. So you can't really do any better than a swarm cell. Whereas the emergency queen cells, they aren't as discriminatory and they can often make those cells around um, one or two day old larvae. So the queens actually develop and are a little more worker-like. Um, so there's actually somewhere in between a queen and a worker. So the, the emergency raised queens, not always, but sometimes can be of lower quality because what they start with is a bit further down the developmental trajectory. So yeah, the older uh, larvae tend to hatch first and it gives them an advantage. Exactly. I'd yeah, like to we add do, a little bit. That's that's uh, right. We do this a lot in our in our research where we actually make really crappy queens on purpose <laughs> so that we can tell what makes a good queen good. And so we graft three-day-old larvae, right, Jen? We graft these three-day-old larvae, um, and they turn out to be these runty, kind of sorry looking, you know, excuses for queens. Uh, but that gives us the power to be able to to uh, infer what makes a good queen good right yeah i'd also like to add you guys mentioned earlier doing walk away splits yeah and i want to make sure folks understand that uh you need a lot of uh young nurse bees to to build that queen cell so i have seen folks that will do a walk away split by taking two frames of nurse bees no queen cell put it into a queen castle that is a recipe for a terrible queen they don't have the nurse bees needed to do the heavy lifting of pulling that cell. You need a lot of nurse bees to build that good queen cell. That's a great point. Yep, when I was talking about the walkaway split, I was thinking at least a, a 10 frame, if not a double deep. Absolutely. So when, when I do a walkaway split, I walk away with the queen with about three <laughs> frames right. and let that big colony that's left there, I'll let them do the heavy lifting of making those cells. So make, walk away with the queen, let the big colony do the heavy lifting. Terrific. Sharon, any other questions? There's a couple. Um, one is, do you have statistics on which is more effective, a drip versus an, o, uh, an OA vapor treatment for mites? That's definitely uh, Adolphus and uh, Lewis's territory. Well, I, go ahead, Adolphus. <laughs> the most effective treatment is one applied so i'd start there and a drip you mean uh, as opposed to not doing anything not applying not doing it that's yeah. right right that's right and i mean a drip that's done correctly at the right time of year is effective uh an oxalic treatment would have 
with a uh, with a with a um, you know the fumigation approach uh, will work uh, preferably in cold weather with a slut, with a small brood uh, situation. When you do it in hot weather with a hive full of brood, you're only knocking back the phoretic mics, and so you'd have to repeat it multiple times which uh, can be kind of hard on the queen if you have to treat them three or four times in the summer. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be my observation, but they work when they're done correctly. Lewis, I know you have thoughts on, on oxalic as well. Well, I guess my biggest deal, so I'm gonna stop calling it oxalic. I'm gonna start calling it APA by oxal, the registered product, because I think that's people get the wrong impression that any oxalic acid is is fair game and that's not true. Uh, Apoboxyl is the registered product that we have to use uh, to be on label. And I think that's an important point. Um, I, don't, I think whatever preference, I mean, I think either way, dribble, dribble or vaporization, I think will be fine. I've used both of them. I prefer the vaporization. I invested a little bit of money in a, in a vaporizer and, but certainly, uh, Doing the dribble is dirt cheap. Like it, you just hardly any infrastructure there, and it, it is effective if you have no cat brood. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, appreciate that. Uh, I, I found one here in the chat that I think actually would be perfect for Jen. If if Jen, you're you're still here, it's really dealing with laying workers. Something that you kind of alluded to um, when you were talking about uh, queen problems. So. Um, David here has a hive with laying workers and put in a frame of eggs from a different hive. Um, what, in your experience, do you think happens with that? What, what's the, the likelihood that something positive will come from that and they'll raise a queen? If Jen is there, if she's not there. She um, needs to be unmuted. And we can't unmute ourselves. Okay, can you hear me now? There, there we go, she's... yes, thank you, John. Right. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so I've tried many times to fix uh, laying worker hives and it is possible, it just takes a lot of patience and most beekeepers, especially hobbyists, if you only have one or two hives, it's really not worth the time or the effort. If you have extra queens sitting around, then it can be done. Um, putting a frame of eggs in there probably won't do a whole lot. So um, you could probably just combine it with another one and get it back to being queen right and then split it up would probably be the best. Bet. Yeah, once, once the laying workers get that taste of anarchy, it's pretty tough to turn them back to the, to the Jedis, right? Once they're at the dark side, they, they don't go back to the light. Yeah, um, only time I ever mess with it is when <laughs> I have extra queens and just try and it usually takes two or three queens to get them back to yeah. a healthy high. And the only, really the only way to do is dilute them, right? Dilute the laying, yeah. because it's only about 10 to 25% of the workers within that colony are actually laying workers. So if you can add a ton of newly emerged worker bees in there, that might kind of dilute them out and um, then they might start raising their own queen or you can introduce your own queen, but they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty touchy. So prevention is definitely worth a pound of cure when it comes to laying workers, like what Jen was saying. So, um, all right, uh, how much more time do we have? Sharon, do we have a couple more questions here in the last uh, four or five minutes? Four, four more minutes and one of them, I, I forget who asked it. Um, it was kind of pertinent for these days. Since alcohol is in such short supply, is there a suggestion for a different kind of liquid? That's a great question. I got that question by email and somebody wanted to know if they could use vodka. Um, and I just told them, sure, but don't go top shelf. <laughs> um, the, the thing with vodka, though, is that it's 40% alcohol, 80 proof, 40% alcohol. Um, and it's actually not quite as good at dislodging the mites in an alcohol wash. 70% is optimal. If you can get your hands on 95 or even 100%, you know, kind of grain alcohol, that's not as good as 70%, believe it or not. So you might have to dilute it down if you have um, kind of grain alcohol or a still in your backyard. Um, so, you know, but where, what are some other alternatives to actual alcohol? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? 
I certainly do. I like to uh, I collect my uh, samples into Ziploc bags, uh, label the colony and the bag. I put it in my freezer and then I process my samples in the kitchen, basically just using a strainer. So I have a strainer that catches the bees, a strainer that catches the mites, and then a bucket that catches the, uh, I use, a, I shake them in windshield washer fluid first, and then I wash them under the uh, sink in the kitchen. It does a great job and you don't need the isopropanol or ethanol, probably don't even need the windshield washer fluid, but I just do it just because I can get a gallon of it for two bucks. But it is, uh, I love the method. I can go through my 30 colony apiary in three hours, get my samples uh, while I'm checking for stores and my queen right, get my 300 bees. And I do that uh, processing in the kitchen a day or two later uh, in the air conditioning with music. And it's beautiful. <laughs> it, it really allows me to get that you know, monitoring done. I monitor 25 or 30 colonies of my own six, at least six times a year. And this method allows me to do that. And uh, I definitely I have some, I have a couple of videos on my uh, YouTube uh, page on how I collect and how I process that. That's great. Adolphus, anything to add there? No, just that I've used windshield washing fluid and it works great. Oh, okay. That's good to know. I guess that is alcohol based too, as well, right? I don't know yeah. what percentage though. I see some people are correcting me in the chat as to the the proof of uh, of moonshine and other things. So sorry, I'm, I'm I I was just king out of ignorance there. Um, Sharon, Sharon, any other uh, questions there? Just a real quick one. Mm -hmm. um, do new hives? This is from Tom Tim. Do new hives started this year have to be concerned with the same mite monitoring at this point? It's kind of um, related started from a package and so they you know started broodless and they slowly grew up that'll give them a little bit of time so yes they will be delayed than a colony coming through winter with brood but it's not something that you don't have to worry about it at all this year would you guys agree with that absolutely so i, I have uh, looked at uh, new packages just two weeks you know, make sure the queen is out and they're laying and all good and find some drone brood, open it up. And there's four mites on a single drone. <laughs> pupa. Yeah. So it's quick. <laughs> your, your, uh, packages are, they come with mites pre-installed, uh, and get in the habit of doing the monitoring. Don't get, don't be lazy about your monitoring. Get, get on it, get good at it. Yep. Um, get with it. Well, that's great. Um, I think that's going to be the last question, at least for, uh, for the recording. Um, thank you again. I want to remind everybody that we are trying to do this every other week. So uh, don't chime in next week, but our next one is scheduled for uh, May 20th. Um, around that period of time, because we're kind of ending spring early this year, um, it's time to start getting ready for the honey harvest. So that's going to be the timely topic that we're going to be talking about. And uh, to follow suit, we also have uh, Ed Spear, who kindly agreed to be our, our interview. Um, and he is the chair of the NCSBA Certified Honey Program. And so uh, he's kind of the go-to person to talk about the different initiatives that our uh, state beekeepers have been doing when it comes to honey. So I think that'll be a, a really good um, follow-up to the, the topic of talking about honey. So um, again, thank you again for attending. If you couldn't make it on, on the Zoom and you've been attending on the uh, YouTube channel, thank you so much. Let us know your experience with the YouTube channel because this was the first time we had done it. Um, subscribe to our channel. Um, that'll help out a lot. You'll get um, automatic uh, notifications when we have a, a live stream, but otherwise uh, keep tab on our webinar page where we'll be um, posting uh, future such events, and uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks again, everybody.